again, good morning. Good, morning. good to see everybody. As you can see, uh, Pastor Meade is not here. No kids, but. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Captain Obvious, right? <laughs> but we do have a uh, Pastor Ben Hamilton here. We'd like to welcome him. And. Thank you. Thank you. Turn in our Bibles to James chapter 4. We're going to talk a little bit this morning about um, planning. And that being said, I'm planning on being here for the rest of the service. Uh, my wife is very, very, very pregnant. And she could go at any minute. Uh, last night we thought that she might actually go last night. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, if I leave in, in, uh, abruptly... You'll know why. Amen. All right. Uh, James chapter 4. We're going to look and read a couple verses there. We're going to start in verse, verse 13. It says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell, and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For the ought to say, the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now, you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, how many of you have not received a handout. I have a handout today, uh, a little outline. Have any of you not received that? Perfect. You have one? You don't have one. Seth, do you have any extras left? Okay. Do we, do we still need a couple more? Okay, good. Everybody's got one. So I have a couple more up here if people needed them. Okay, yeah, excellent. Well, Plans are a good thing. I think that uh, plans are uh, something which we all do, right? We all make some plans. Uh, every one of you who came here today didn't just accidentally show up here. Uh, you had to plan uh, to get in your car, to get dressed. It looks like you all got dressed before you came. Uh, I all got dressed, got in your car, came here, showed up uh, by 1030, and uh, are here now to hear... Uh, from the Word of God. Amen. It's impossible to get things done with plan, without plans. It really is. Um, there, was a, there was a man named Zig Ziglar who was a, a great motivational speaker. And I love his name, by the way, Zig Ziglar. And uh, he came up with a lot of different quotes. But one of them was, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every single time. And that's true. If you don't have a good plan... And you're not going to get there. Now, the passage we're going to look at today uh, is going to talk about a good plan versus a bad plan, or a bad plan versus a good plan. There, there's a man here in this passage uh, who the Lord is typifying and saying he's, he, he has a plan, uh, but his plan is not good. And in opposition to that plan, here's how he really should work things out. I found over and over again that sometimes things don't go according to my plans. Uh, my being here today uh, is is wonderful, but uh, I did not know if it was going to work out because of my wife, uh, because I didn't know if she was going to to be in labor or not. And uh, not having plans go the way that we think that they should go can be a very very frustrating thing. For uh, and for me, uh, to actually sit down and have a plan and then have something come up and ruin my plan, that can put me in a bad mood uh, and, and frustrate me. And uh, There are so many things uh, in life that can disrupt our plans. But we don't have to be upset about those if we have our pro a proper perspective on planning. Um, Franklin Covey, uh, he's a, he designed um, a planning system uh, 
and it's very well laid out, and uh, he he organized how to how to set up a good plan for your life, for your month, for your day, for your week, uh, for minute by minute, really, and how you're going to get things done throughout your day. And the man in this passage, as we look at his plan to begin with, seems like he would have been a, a star a star pupil of the Franklin Covey planning system because he had what every plan takes. And the first the first blank in your handout today is the perfect plan. Okay? This man had what by the world's eyes would have been a perfect plan. Now what does a perfect plan have in it? Well, a perfect plan usually has a clear vision. What your objective is. Okay, you plan through your day and you plan what you want to get done by the end of that day. Uh, when I was in college, uh, people encouraged me to sit down, sit down and write out my plans for my next 15 years. And I set up five-year plans, 10-year plans, and 15-year plans. Now when you're in college, there are a lot of variables uh, that still have not been figured out, like the fact that I wasn't married, the fact that I didn't have a car, the fact that I didn't have a job. There's a lot of things that, that I didn't know, a lot of details that I didn't know. But I kind of had an idea of where I wanted to end up within those five-year, 10-year, 15-year plan. That's a vision. It's not very specific necessarily, but I had an idea of where I wanted to go. I had uh, very clear objectives and purposes. Now, what according to verse 13 is the objective and the plan of this man. It's found in the last uh, two words of the verse. Get gain. That is his end goal. He has all these other things coming up before, but his first step, his, his, his main objective, his main purpose in all that he is discussing is to go and to get game. And there's nothing wrong with that in itself. That's just what his purpose is. So, in order to get to his goal, he had to have measurable steps. I, I, if I ever sent out 15-year plans or 10-year plans, 5-year plans or uh, week, week plans on how to get something on right now, uh, I am studying... Uh, I'm starting to study. I've not been ordained as a pastor yet, so I'm going to be ordained in April of this next year. In order to get there, I have a lot of studying to do. I have to go through a lot of theologies and just write things down, be ready to take a basically four-hour oral test where pastors grill me on everything I know about the Bible, and that terrifies me, quite honestly. Uh, the Bible is a very big book, and I've studied it for a long time, but there are a lot of questions which people can ask that will confuse, especially if you are under pressure and you don't have your notes to look at, which is uh, all going to happen. Uh, I'm going to have to be prepared. In order to be prepared, I have to set up a study, a study schedule. I'm going to study about this part of theology on this week. And then the next week, I'm going to study this part of theology. So I get to a point where I get all these theologies, uh, all these specific doctrines studied, uh, and then I can review them and put them together and hopefully be prepared to uh, be grilled and answer all these questions from men who've been in the ministry for 20 years or more. Okay? So it's going to be a challenge for me. So I have to have measurable steps to know how I'm going to get to my destination. Here, this man has some measurable steps. He says, uh, we will go into such and such a city continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Okay? We are going to, first of all, what are we going to do? We are going to leave where we are. This man is going to leave where he is. He's going to uh, do all that it takes to uh, depart from where he is. If he's renting, he's got to cancel his lease. Uh, he's got to give up his home. Maybe he's going to put it in charge of a steward. Uh, set up everything that needs to be taken care of for leaving that individual place for a certain amount of time. He's going to go into such a city, find a place to set up shop, find a place to live. Uh, these are not easy things to do. Uh, continue there a year and buy and sell. We don't know what he's buying and selling from 
this passage. Uh, he's just going to buy merchandise and sell merchandise. He's a retailer. He's going to buy at wholesale and sell at retail and make a profit. And uh, we don't have all the details here. And not every plan which we make has to have all the details, but we have to have an idea of how we're going to get from one point to another. Now, what he's doing is not wrong. This is good planning um, by the world standards. And we can even incorporate what he's doing into how we develop plans for ourselves. We're going to look to see further how his perspective on his planning was a little bad, but the form of his planning is not bad. Uh, if you look throughout, and, and, the, and the concept of planning is not bad either, is if you look throughout the whole of Scripture, uh, God desires for his people to do things in orderliness, in a, an orderly way. God is not the author of confusion, uh, but he wants us to do things orderly. And this man seems to have a, a good grip on how things are going to go. Then your next, your next um, blank would be uh, to have designated times uh, for me personally. If I do not set a day on a calendar to get something done, or an hour in the day to get something done, it doesn't get done. I have to know when I'm going to do it. Andrea and I uh, plan differently, okay? She plans things. She just kind of has an idea of what she wants to get done by the end, end of the month, and as she goes, she gets things done. It doesn't work for me. If I want to get something done, I have to know every step of my day. Okay, I, I'm going to get up at such and such a time. At 10 o'clock, I'm going to do this activity for an hour. I'm going to do another activity for another hour. Because what ends up happening with me is I will, A, get bogged down in one activity. I'll start something, and I'll just continue to work on it and, and until it's complete. Because I, I don't multitask very well. Okay? I would rather just work on one thing, get it done, and then move on to the next thing. Or, because I don't have a, a time set to do something, I will let distractions take over. And uh, I will uh, find something along the way of my day that will keep me from getting done my measurable steps. So, uh, this man here as well has a designated time. So it says today or tomorrow, so he, he has a date set. Uh, it's not just uh, a varied time. I have, I'm going to go today or tomorrow, one of these two times, and I'm going to go and I'm going to live for uh, a year in this place. Now, they, they say when you invest, um, at least when I read about it, uh, I don't invest in, in the stock market or anything like that because I don't have any money to do so, but uh, they say <laughs> that you invest uh, for periods of time with clear goals so that you don't end up holding on to a stock or something longer than you need to and end up losing. You have a goal of what you want to see happen, and then when your goal is reached, you sell. Okay? This man, he knew exactly what he was doing, where he was going, and when he was going to get it done. Actually, a great, great idea for planning by the world. Like I said, uh, Franklin, Franklin Covey would have been proud of him. Now, let's look at the problems in his plan. First of all, uh, there is a lack of control. Uh, there's only one individual who ever walked to this earth who was really in control of all the circumstances around him, and that was Jesus Christ. Okay, None of us are in control of all the conditions around us. I... Uh, I like reading a little bit about history, and I like reading about New York City history. I, I came here to minister in the city five years ago, and I find this city to be a fascinating place. Um, but I believe the Lord has called me to start a church in the Bronx, New York, and uh, I'm on deputation now. We're looking to start a church there uh, up uh, by Fordham University, and uh, we're, we're going to get started there as soon as possible. But as I've been looking at the different neighborhoods, I try to find out a little bit about them and study the history. And actually, 10 years ago was the first time I came to this city. I was an intern uh, with Shalom Ministries in Craig Hartman. And I was out on the street handing out 
tracks, and I went, walked by a library, and the library was throwing away books, which I thought that was kind of interesting. So I picked up one off the, off the street, and it was a book about the General Slocum. Does anybody know about the General Slocum? No, okay, this is a great piece of, uh, of New York City history. Um, uh, let me see, I, I have it written down here so I don't mess up the dates. But on, on June 15th, 1904, Pastor George Haas led his Jew German Lutheran congregation on board the General Slocum. The excursion ferry had been chartered by the church group for a one-day trip out to Huntington, Long Island. As the ship pulled away from the dock in, lower, in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, the conditions were beautiful, and uh, it appeared that all of their plans uh, had paid off, and that God had given them uh, a great vacation, a relaxing time. And you imagine this ship traveling up the East River, uh, full of uh, vacationers for one day, getting out of the city, getting out of the, uh, back then it was the Industrial Revolution, and uh, getting away from the smog and getting away from everything. It's a German immigrant population that lived in poverty, and they're getting this great opportunity to go to the country, Huntington, Long Island. And uh, everything seemed fine. The, the thought of danger probably never crossed the minds of the people on board this ship. Uh, many of these people on this ship had crossed the Atlantic Ocean on a ship, and they were just going up the East River and down the Long Island Sound to Huntington, Long Island. Well, a few minutes into their trip, as they were uh, getting to the Rand right past Randall's Island, actually right where the Triborough Bridge now exists, uh, the cry of fire went up. And pretty soon the whole ship was engulfed in flame. And, and try as he might to land the ship on shore, the captain of the ship was unable to do so. Uh, 1,358 people boarded that ship in the morning. 1,021 of them died that day. That was the greatest disaster in New York City until September 11th. More people perished in that disaster than any other disaster. We never hear about it because it was over 100 years ago. But it's really interesting. These people, they had a plan. Their plan was not bad in itself. And uh, they probably even sought the will of God on that plan. But the reality of the fact is that they weren't in control of conditions. There are so many conditions which are simply out of our control. I mean, the weather, one of them, okay? Planning out that activity, you always have to take the chance that the weather is going to ruin your plans, right? Uh, a political situation. Uh, another thing I, I, I like studying history, um, when the Berlin Wall went up, it went up in the nighttime, uh, there was something like 5,000 people, I don't have the number written down here so I might not be absolutely correct, but I believe it was about 5,000 people who went over to East Germany during the day, planning on staying over just for a night and returning the next day. But the wall went up and they weren't allowed to return home. That was the end of their vacation, okay? Tough way to go. I, mean, I think many of them eventually got back, but they woke up in the morning and all of a sudden there was a wall in their way. This man in this, pa in this chapter, he thought he had everything figured out, but he didn't take into, con into consideration necessarily the fact that he was not in control of the situations. And then economic situation. How many people have we seen ruined economically by a turn of the market? Uh, this, this is a common thing. This man, uh, he was planning for the best and he was not prepared for the worst. Uh, he was not only not in control of the conditions, uh, he was not in control of his own longevity. Uh, verse 14 talks about how he is not in control. Verse 14 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, you have no idea what is going to happen tomorrow. 
I tell you truthfully, you don't have an idea of what's going to happen 45 minutes from now. Okay? You don't have an idea. You might still be here listening to me preach. Probably not. I'll probably be done considerably earlier than that. Uh, but you really don't know. And uh, that's that can be very scary because you don't know what's going to happen uh, with your life. Uh, we can try to do things to preserve our life, to lengthen our life. We can try to uh, exercise. We can try to uh, eat well. We can try to take care of our bodies, and God would have us to do that. But in reality, none of us knows how much longer we'll live. And because of that, we need to be prepared for the eventuality of dying. Uh, this man, in this passage, so far as we know, the thought of dying never crossed his mind. So far as we know, he was thinking of one-year plans and never thought that within that year he could possibly die. See, the thing is with us, we often make short-term plans, not realizing that within that time, our life may end. And even beyond that, we get consumed with short-term plans and forget the fact that every, short, every section of short-term plans that passes, we're using up our life. Our life is only how long? Well, it says here, in the, in, the, in the same verse, and it's only a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. So this man was probably making uh, plans, but he was not realizing that he was using up at the same time the most valuable thing which God had given to him, that was time. He was using up the time for his own purposes rather than for serving God's purposes. And because of that, we need to get our focus right. Uh, we need to, first of all, be prepared for death. And how can we be prepared for death? There's only one way that we can be prepared for death, and that is knowing what will happen when we do die. That is one of the very few things which we can know. We can know what will happen to us when we die. The Bible teaches very clearly that it is appointed unto man once to die and after, the, after that the judgment. So the end of life, the end of breathing, is not the end of existence. Man goes on, not in body, in spirit, in soul. And man will be given a spiritual body with a consciousness and feeling, and he will either go to one or two places. He will go to either spend eternity with Christ in heaven, or he will spend eternity apart from Christ in torment in the lake of fire. But thankfully, we can know which one we're going to. Because the Bible teaches that if we place our faith totally upon the finished work of Jesus Christ, we don't have to doubt. It's a promise that all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. And there's a lot in that all who should all call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. That is understanding who Christ is. Who is Jesus? He is God. He is God in human flesh. And he died on the cross because we are sinners. And because we could never pay for our own sin. Even an eternity apart from God in torment never pays for the sin which we have done against God. If it did then it would not, then, then, he, then hell would not be eternal. If there was any amount of suffering which we could pay for that would pay for our sin, then hell would not be eternal, but it is. And we have to understand that there is no way which we ourselves can pay. And we must depend totally upon the fact that Jesus dying on the cross, shedding his blood, was the only payment for sin. And then understanding that placing our dependence upon him alone, not upon our works, not upon our own goodnesses, which really aren't even that good, uh, can save us. That, that None of that can save us but Jesus Christ alone. And once we have placed that faith, 
God promises in his scripture that we may know that we have eternal life. Okay. So it's important to know what we can know. Okay. We can't know what's going to happen in the next minute. But we can know if we've trusted Jesus Christ what will happen the moment that we die. Right? Okay. So, he has a lack of control, this man, of his conditions. He has a lack of control of his own longevity. And uh, the second problem with his plan I have here is a wrong vision. Now, got to be careful here because being wealthy is not sin. Having goods is not sin. Making a profit is not sin. This man is a capitalist here, okay? He, he, he's, he's carrying on good business. He's not sinning in what he's doing here. But we find from this passage further on here that his focus, his vision is wrong in the fact that his entire purpose for doing what he does is that of making gain. Gain and riches should not be an end. They are a means to an end. They are a means to the end of serving God. Uh, verse 15. For that ye ought to say. Okay. Here is the problem with your plan. Here is uh, the proper vision, vision of, of what we should have here. Uh, whereas ye ought to say, or if you ought to say, if the Lord will... We shall live and do this or that. This is total surrender right here, okay? This is totally surrendered to the will of God. God, if you want me to live, I'll live. If you want me to die, I'll die. Whatever brings you the most glory, that's what I want. Whatever is your will. Not my will. As Jesus Christ himself said regarding the will of the Father, not my will be done, but thine. And for Jesus, that meant death upon the cross for our sakes. Because God wanted to have a relationship with us. He was willing to send his own son to die in our place. So, first of all, we shall live, and then we shall do this or that. Do you put your plans through that sieve? Do you put your plans through that um, filter? Lord, what do you want me to do today? What, do you, what is your will for this moment. So often, we go on, I go on, without thinking about that. I think about my problems that I'm facing. I think about the goals that I have for the day, or the way I think things should go, rather than first stopping and saying, Lord, is this what you want me to do? Or is that what you want me to do? Now, I kind of tend toward this, but Lord, I want to make sure that this is what you want me to do, and not that over there. Because, Lord, your will, that's what I really want. I might have a, a, a personal desire, a personal feeling. Uh, Jesus, of course, being God, he had a personal desire not to go through the pain of the cross. But that was superseded by his desire to obey God, to obey the Father, to, to, to carry out the will uh, of God and his love for us. Shall we do this, or shall we do that? It's a good question for you. Are you totally surrendered to God's will? Are you totally surrendered to what God would have you to do right after this? You know, one of my least favorite phrases that I have tried to uh, and get rid of in my life, not just to say it, but actually to mean it, 
is so often I, I used to find myself saying, well, I know I really shouldn't do that, but... <laughs> do you ever think about what that means? Okay, it's like, I really should not have this piece of cake, but I'm going to eat it anyway. Well, if you really shouldn't, according to what God says about taking care of your body, and, or, or, or if you know that it's wrong, that you mean it's sin, and you go ahead and do it, you're sinning, sinning willfully. And we talked about that on Thursday night, right? About how uh, you sin willfully. <laughs> That's not something to play around with. That's not something just to excuse with a silly statement like, I know I shouldn't, but okay, I'll do it. That's foolishness when it considers the will of God. We need to get that kind of thinking out of our minds to the point where, Lord, whatever you want, that's what I'll do. Forget about what I want. You have a better plan. All right. So we move on from there, and we move on to the last two verses. And it can seem as if the last two verses are somewhat separate from the narrative which we just discussed. But in real in reality, they're not. Uh, they are they are connected. For he ought to say, if the Lord will, we ought will do this and that. But ye now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So, you have there the pride of planning, and then your next link would be the joy of control. He says, ye rejoice in your boastings. Your boastings being the original plan, this plan of going to buy and sell and get king. You like to think that you're in control, don't you? Every one of us likes the feeling of control. None of us particularly care for the feeling of being subject to circumstances, to not knowing what's coming, to not being prepared. Uh, if you go all the way back to the garden, it was even this temptation that caused Adam and Eve to sin, where Satan told them that they shall even be like gods. They shall even be in control of the situation. And we fight this all of the time. I've never heard somebody say, you know what, I really just don't like knowing what's coming. And I, 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 I mean, I really, I really like just, you know, being surprised by alarming events in my life. And I like having my plans disrupted. And uh, I, like th I like it when things change in front of me. I love being stuck in traffic. It's just a wonderful thing. It's not common that you have that. And, 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 and in reality, we like to say, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go do this and 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 this. And then I'm going to do that. Without consulting God without thinking about the possibility of failure. And that's a boast. He says, you rejoice in your bragging of how you are in control of the situation. You may not say it like that. You probably don't. I hope you don't. You don't think you're boasting against God. But when you're not consulting His will, when you're thinking that subconsciously you are able to make these things happen. That's what happens. And this is one thing I have learned from working in contracting sometimes. I have plans and I go in and I tell a customer, okay, this is going to take me two days and get this project done. <laughs> two weeks later, I'm saying, why am I still on this project? The possibility I overestimated my own abilities and did not consider the fact that there may be circumstances which would arise which would be out of my control. It happens. Things 
happen and change us. And, and, and God allows, brings things into our life. But you, now you rejoice in your boastings. All such evil, all such boasting is evil. So, the evil of boasting, evil of pride, uh, the evil of boasting is to be blank there. We all participate in this. We all love to say that we are in control. Submission to God, even though we know in our heads that He is right, is not an easy thing. We like to boast against it. And that is not the spirit of Christ within us, that is the same attitude which Satan has, which is, I will, I will, I will, I will. And if you look in Ezekiel, where it talks about Satan wanting to overthrow God five times, he says, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this. And whereas we do not have to change the way we speak, I'm not saying that every time you say you're going to do something, I'm going to go to the store by the will of God. You don't have to say that, okay? You'll be really strange, okay? You go to the office and say, I'm going to go get a drink of water by the will of God. But in here, that needs to be our thinking. That needs to be the way we start processing things. Where we understand that we are God's subjects. And we are not kings on our own. We are not we are servants, not the masters. And then finally, the proper plan uh, says Christ's vision. Uh, first of all, do you remember how we had at the beginning? We had a clear vision. The proper plan is a Christ vision. Of course, having what Christ would have have us to do. Uh, verse, verse 17, Therefore, to him that knoweth you could do good, and do with it not to him in his sin. We need to have the vision that Christ has that whatever he would have us to do is what we'll do. We need to have movable steps. Okay? Now there is one time that the word movable appears in the Bible. That is not the kind of steps we're talking about. Um, that talks about um, a strange woman in a book of Proverbs. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the, positive, the idea of flexibility. Where we are okay with the fact that God is going to bring circumstances into our life that would really generally upset us. That those things which would get us totally frustrated. Uh, we've had computer issues in our house recently. Those aren't fun. Okay? I don't know if you've ever had your identity stolen. I've heard that's not fun. Yeah. Those kind of things are not fun. But really, a lot of those things are totally beyond our control. And if they happen, they happen because God allowed them to happen. At exactly. our point, our attitude should not be that of anger or frustration. But an understanding that God allowed this into our life for a purpose. And we're going to be satisfied with that no matter what. We need to be flexible. Plans are a good thing. But you need to be flexible. You need to be flexible to the point where you are busy about your day. You're going about your grocery shopping or you're going about your haircut and somebody comes up to you and they give you a golden opportunity to share the gospel with them and you don't just say to yourself, I'm too busy for this right now and ignore it. That happened to me recently. I was in Home Depot, okay? I was in Home Depot trying to get paint. And I asked the guy behind the paint counter a question. Not a great idea. And I went over to the wall to pick up a paint sample. And I came back, and all of a sudden, there were eight people in front of me in line. And not all of them spoke English very well. So, 
it was not a fun time for me. I was there with one of my kids, and we stood there in line for 40 minutes in the paint counter. I needed to get this paint today. And my three-year-old son at the time was not very well behaved, and the lady next to me was trying to make things better. And she was talking to me, and we were dressed up because we were actually going to church right after that. And she started talking about God. And I was already frustrated because <laughs> God was not giving me my paint. And she said something that was just totally wrong. And I just said, uh-huh. <laughs> because I was thinking to myself, I don't have time to deal with this right now. I don't want to deal with this right now. I was upset because God had allowed something into my life that I didn't think belonged there, which was the delay. And I was not ready to interrupt my plans any further to speak to this woman about her wrong perspective of God. And say, well, you know what? The Bible doesn't actually say that. My thought was, I'm next in line here now, lady. I have no way I'm going to take the time to talk to you because you're going to open up a whole can of worms and you're being nice to me right now, so step back. That was wrong. That was sin. That's something I had to confess before the Lord. We need to have our steps movable, as your blank says there. And then we need to have a proper definition of time. What is time? It says here, it doesn't say anything here, it says your life is a vapor. Okay, your life is made up of time. And that time is very short. Uh, it like, appears like, like a steam out of a, out of a teapot. Just there for a moment, it disappears. And in, in reality of eternity, that is exactly what it is. Uh, and even, even to make a vapor that appears for a little time, it, it seems like an exaggeration how much time we have. When you consider how how long time, well, time ceases to exist when the eternal state begins, okay? There you go. There is no end of time. Uh, there, there, the, time we, the time we have on this earth is the only time we have to serve God. And it's very short, and life seems to begin one day and end the next. So don't make plans that use up your time saying to yourself, when I finish this, I will serve God better. When I get to this stage in my life, then I will become serious about my service and devotion to God. I grew up in a Christian home, and I had these kinds of misconceptions. I thought to myself, well, when I'm a high schooler, I will start reading my Bible more consistently. I was saved at a young age. You know what? I found that didn't change very much. I thought, well, when I get to college, I will be a super Christian because super Christians go to Bible college. That's not true. Okay? You know who goes to Bible college? People like me, non-super Christians, who want to meet other super Christians, and they are very disappointed when they get there, <laughs> and they find out that people are just like them. So I thought I would become spiritual instantaneously upon walking upon the Bible college campus. It doesn't happen that way. I thought to myself, well, I will become a real spiritual leader when I get married. Because then I'll have to lead about a wife. And then you know, we'll just have such great conversations that build each other up in the Lord. And thankfully, that takes place. But not to the degree I thought it would. Okay? I didn't, I didn't become more spiritual just because I got married. I thought when I have kids, then I've got to really do better. It doesn't work that way. You have to surrender your time and your will to God now. You can't put it off. 
doesn't just happen over time. You must give yourself to God right now. Uh, I don't like the, the pattern of thought which says that growth for a Christian is a slow process. Therefore, don't expect big steps. Yes, it takes a long time to grow in the Lord, but at the same time, we need to take big steps toward it. And that is, when we are confronted with the Word of God, and it is in contrast to the way we are presently living, it needs to change now. It's not something that we just, oh man, I can't deal with that right now. I'll put it on the back burner and deal with that later. No! If God is convicting you of it, deal with it when it convicts you of it. Right away. Right away. So our definition of time is that which God has given us to serve Him. This man, in verse 13, we see nothing wrong with his plan. In verse 14 through 17, we find there really is nothing wrong with his plan at all, except that his attitude and his thinking behind it is wrong. And that is that he is unsurrendered to the will of God and oversure of himself. to know that we are prepared for dying and we need to know the will of God so that we may follow it and be ready to do whatever he asks when he asks without delay because time is that which God has given us to serve him now. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that you have given us time today to reflect upon your word. Lord, we have no guarantee that our life will continue beyond the next second. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us guarantees of what will happen after this life, whether we spend eternity with you in glory forever in heaven or whether we will spend eternity apart from you in hell. Thank you that we can know that we will spend eternity with you in heaven if we simply surrender our will to you. We understand that you have paid for our sins with your precious blood and risen again from the dead to offer us eternal life. Lord, I pray that if there be any here today who do not know what will happen to them once they die, that they would call upon you as their Savior so that they may know that they have eternal life. Lord, for those of us here who do know that we have eternal life because we have trusted in your Son, Lord, help us to be surrendered to your will minute by minute, whether it be that we live or that we die. May we be surrendered to that. And may our actions and our plans be submitted to you. Understanding that we have such a short time to serve you that we should not waste a minute of it. Lord, I pray that uh, you would keep this message in our hearts. Remind us of it as we go through our days and set up our schedules and, 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 and go about the minutia of life. They would be prepared for your will and be satisfied with whatever comes your way, comes our way. In Jesus' name.